Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, um, so we're going to continue on with our lecture series, and we're going to start talking about thermochemistry. And this is where we start looking at colligative properties of solutions and things like that. So um, we've already touched a little bit on it, but we're going to move forward with it. So thermodynamics is the science of the relationship between heat and other forms of energy. Thermochemistry is the study of the quantity of heat absorbed or evolved by chemical reactions. And there are six basic types of energy, kinetic, potential, chemical, heat, electric, and radiant. There are br three broad concepts of energy as well. For example, kinetic energy is the energy associated with an object by virtue of its motion. Potential energy is the energy of an object that has virtue of its position in a field of force. Usually we think of it in a field of gravity, but not always. Internal energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of the particles making up a substance, and so that leads to chemical energy. And we'll look at each of these in detail. So kinetic energy is an object of mass, m, and a speed or velocity, which is v squared that has a kinetic energy, which is Ek. So this shows that the kinetic energy of an object depends on both its mass and its speed. So if we take a look at this question, it says, consider the kinetic energy of a person whose mass is 130 pounds traveling at a car, in a car at 60 miles per hour, or 26.8 meters per second. So I'm going to show you how to um, do that problem. So what we do is we start off with our Ek equals one-half mv squared. And we know what our, vo our velocity is, which was that 26.8 meters per second. And we're going to square that. And we know that our mass is 59 kilograms from the question. And then we multiply all of that times one half. So what we get is 2.12 times 10 to the fourth kilograms meters squared per second squared. And one kilogram per meter squared per second squared is the same thing as one joule, which is the SI unit of energy. So one joule. So it's 2.12 times 10 to the fourth joules is our kinetic energy in that question. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Potential energy is the energy that depends on the position, such as height, in a field of force, for example, like gravity. For example, the water of a given mass m at the top of a dam is at a relatively high position h in the gravitational field g. So let's calculate the potential energy of this, of this water. So we've got 1,000 pounds of water, or 453.6 kilograms, at the top of a 300-foot, or 91.44 meter dam. So I'm going to show you how to do that one. So let's get a new screen. So remember I said energy of potential is m times g times h. Now g is representing the acceleration due to gravity in this equation, but g would be the acceleration of any field. So just keep that in mind. But most of the things we'll talk about in chemistry deal with gravity. It just, it won't always in physics. Okay, so we've got 453.6 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is the acceleration due to gravity. And that dam was a th it was 300 feet, so 91.44 meters high. So again, you can see that our units are going to be kilograms meters squared over second squared, so it'll come out in joules. So it comes out in 4.06 times 10 to the fifth joules. Make sure that you always answer in scientific notation when you do these problems because otherwise you can end up with hideously large numbers and I really don't want you to deal with that. 
Okie dokie. So the internal energy is the energy of the particles making up a substance. The total energy of a system is the sum of its kinetic, potential, and internal energy. Internal energy is U in this equation. The law of conservation of energy states that energy may be conserved from one form to another, but the total quantities of energy remain constant. In other words, you can change it from heat into kinetic energy, for example, like an internal combustion engine would do, but you don't lose that energy. It goes into um, that movement or that kinetic energy. In chemical reactions, heat is often transport, transferred from the system to its surroundings or vice versa. So internal versus external. The substance or mixture of substances under study in which a change occurs is called the thermodynamic system or simply system. The surroundings are everything else near the vicinity of that system. Heat is defined as the energy that flows into or out of a system because of a difference in temperature between the system and its surroundings. Heat it flows from high temperature to low temperature. So once the temperatures become equal, the heat flow will stop. Heat is denoted by the symbol Q, and if the sign of Q is positive, then heat is absorbed by the system, so it's endothermic. If the sign of the Q is negative, then heat is evolved by the system, or it's exothermic, because heat is leaving, so it feels hot. The heat of reaction is the value Q required to return a system to the given temperature at the completion of a reaction, and you can see that here with the green bar. An exothermic process is a chemical reaction or physical change in which heat is evolved, so Q is negative. An endothermic process is a chemical reaction or physical change in which heat is absorbed, so Q is positive. Exothermicity means out of a system, and endothermicity means into a system. The heat absorbed or evolved by a reaction depends on the conditions under which it occurs. I'm going to say that again because it's really important. The heat absorbed or evolved by a reaction depends on the conditions under which it occurs. Usually a reaction takes place in an open vessel and therefore at constant pressure of the atmosphere. The heat of this type of reaction is denoted as Q and then subscript P, and you can see that here the heat at constant pressure. Enthalpy, which is denoted as H, is an extensive property of a substance that can be used to obtain the heat absorbed or evolved in a chemical reaction. An extensive property is one that depends on the quantity of a substance, so in other words, enthalpy is mass dependent. Enthalpy is a state function, a property of a system that depends only on its present state and is independent of any previous history of the system or independent of path. So the change in enthalpy for a reaction at a given temperature and pressure, called the enthalpy of reaction, is obtained by subtracting the enthalpy of the reactants from the enthalpy of the products. And you can see that here denoted as delta H. The change in enthalpy, delta H, is equal to the heat of reaction at constant pressure. So this represents the entire change in internal energy, or delta U, minus any expansion or work done by the system. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. The internal energy of a system, U, is precisely defined as the heat at constant pressure plus the work done by the system. In chemical systems, work is defined as the change in volume at a given pressure. That is, W equals negative P delta V. Since the heat at constant pressure QP represents delta H, then delta U equals delta H minus P delta V. So delta H is essentially the heat obtained or absorbed by a reaction in an open vessel where the work portion of delta U is unmeasured. That seems like a whole lot of deltas and, and subscripts and such, you're going to need to practice with this material in order to really understand these equations, so make sure that you do do so. This all leads us to the enthalpy of reactions, and you see that in thermochemical equations. 
A thermochemical equation is the chemical equation for a reaction, including the phase labels, in which the equation is given a molar interpretation, and the enthalpy of the reaction for these molar amounts is written directly after the equation. So in a thermochemical equation, it is important to note these phase labels because the enthalpy change, delta H, depends on the phase of the substances. Two important rules for manipulating thermochemical equations is that when a thermochemical equation is multiplied by any factor, the value of delta H for the new equation is obtained by multiplying the delta H in the original by the same factor. When the chemical reaction is reversed, the value of delta H is also reversed in sign. So let's take a look at this one. Consider the reaction of methane, CH4, burning in the presence of oxygen at constant pressure. Given the following equation, how much heat could be attained by the combustion of 10 grams of methane? So here's our equation, CH4 plus 2O2, both of these are gaseous, yields carbon dioxide gas and liquid water and our delta H is 890, negative 890.3, so it is exothermic, which makes sense since it's on fire. Okay, so let's take a look at how we solve that. You get a new screen. Okay, so we've got the 10 grams of methane, CH4. Remember our factor level, we need to go to moles, so one mole of CH4 weighs or has a mass of 16.0 grams. So that gives us 0.625 moles of CH4. Because remember, anytime we talk about enthalpy change, we have to use those moles. And that's pretty much all we need to do for that reaction. But we have to multiply it by our delta H. So we take that 0.625 moles of CH4 times our delta H, which was negative 890.3 kilojoules. And so what we get is five, negative 556 kilojoules when we multiply that out. Okay, so let's take a look at measuring heats of reaction. Remember our Q for heat is C, which is the uh, heat capacity, times the change in temperature. To see how heats of reactions are measured, we have to look at the heat required to raise the temperature of a substance because the thermochemical measurement is based on the relationship between heat and temperature change. The heat required to raise the temperature of a substance is its heat capacity, and different substances have different heat capacities, water having one of the highest. The heat capacity C of a sample of substance is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of the sample of the substance 1 degree Celsius. So changing the temperature of the sample requires heat to um, do that. So let's take a look. Suppose a piece of iron requires 6.70 joules of heat to raise its temperature by 1 degree Celsius. The quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of the piece of iron from 25 degrees to 35 degrees Celsius is... So let's take a look at how to solve that. Get a new screen. So remember, it's Q equals C delta T. So delta T means that you take the final temperature, which was that 35.0 degrees Celsius, minus the initial temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. So our delta T is 10. We're trying to fi find what our um, heat capacity, but we know how much it requires. So we've got 6.70 joules per Celsius, degrees Celsius times our delta T, which is 10 degrees Celsius. So you see that our Celsius goes away, so our Q gives us 67.0 joules.
That's how much heat is required. Heat capacities are also compared for one gram amounts of substances. So the specific heat capacity or specific heat is the heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. And you can see here again, liquid water has the highest specific heat. You will be provided with the specific heats of almost everything, but liquid water is one that I want you to know. So make sure that you know that liquid water has a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram de degree Celsius. So to find the specific heat um, required, you must multiply the specific heat, S, of the substance times its mass in grams, M, and the temperature change, or delta T. So let's take a look at this one. Calculate the heat absorbed when the temperature of 15 grams of water is raised from 20 to 50 degrees Celsius. Specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to solve that. Do, 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 do. Give me a second. There we go. Okay. Too many windows are open, clearly. Okay, so remember it's Q equals S times mass times delta T. So our S is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. times the mass, which was 15 grams. So that gets rid of that unit, times the delta T, which it went from 50 to 20. So 50 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius. And when we multiply that all out, we get 1.88 times 10 to the third joules, because our Celsius also go away as far as units are concerned. So 1.88 times 10 to the third joules is the amount of heat absorbed by that reaction. A calorimeter is a device that is used to measure the heat absorbed or evolved during a physical or chemical change. The heat absorbed by the calorimeter and its contents is the negative of the heat of reaction. So first you have to calculate the heat absorbed by the calorimeter. So we're going to take a look at this one. We got 23.6 grams of calcium chloride, CaCl2, dissolved in water in a calorimeter. The temperature rose from 25 to 38.7, and the heat capacity of the solution and the calorimeter is 1258 joules per degree Celsius. What's the enthalpy change per mole of calcium chloride? So let's take a look at how to solve that. So as I said before, first you have to calculate the heat absorbed by the calorimeter. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got Q of the calorimeter equals C times delta T. And our C is 1,258 joules per degree Celsius times our delta T, which is 38.7 minus 25.0 degrees Celsius. So our Q of the calorimeter is 1.72 times 10 to the fourth joules. So now we have to calculate the heat per mole of calcium chloride. So calcium chloride's molar mass is 111.1 grams. So we've got 36.2, or I'm sorry, ooh, dyslexic time, 23.6 grams of Cl2 times one mole CaCl2 over 111.1 .1 grams CaCl2. So that gets rid of our grams. We're in moles. We like moles. Moles are good. So we've got 0.212 moles of Cl CaCl2. So now we can calculate the heat per mole of calcium chloride. So remember that, that, and that's enthalpy, is heat per mole. So we've got delta H equals the heat of reaction divided by the number of moles 
of CaCl2. So our delta H equals negative 17.2 kilojoules. Okay, divided by 0 0.212 moles. So our enthalpy change is negative 81.1 kilojoules per mole. Now, how did I get 17.2 kilojoules? Because if you see here, it's 1.72 times 10 to the fourth joules. So I changed it to kilojoules to make it a little more manageable. So negative 17.2 kilojoules. So that's our enthalpy change. It changed by negative 81.16 or 81.1 kilojoules per mole. Hess's law of heat summation states that for chemical equations that can be written as the sum of two or more steps, the enthalpy change for the overall equation is the sum of the enthalpy changes for the individual steps. In other words, you just add the delta H's. Okay? That's really all you got to do. So if you take a look, we've got 2S plus 3O2 gives you 2SO3, and that's it. Okay, and you can see that this bottom one is the same as two of these up here. Okay? So it's, it's the same. You, so you're going to multiply that first equations delta H by 2 because you need 2 S's and 3 O2's and then you would just add them together. So let's take a look at how you'd actually do that. So you got your 2 S plus 2 O2's gives you 2 SO2's. So that now cancels out with the 2 SO2's at the beginning. You got another O2 down at the bottom, and that gives you 2SO3. So that gives you a total for the reaction 2S plus 3O2s gives you 2SO3s. So since we multiplied the first one by 2, it's negative 297 times 2 plus 198 times negative 1 because we're subtracting it. So that gives us a delta H of negative 792 kilojoules. Okay, so why did I do it this way? Because we reversed the second reaction, so that gives us a negative 1. Anytime you reverse the reaction, you change the delta H by negative 1. So sometimes it becomes negative, sometimes it becomes positive. just depends. So, the next step you need to do is to practice with this material. So make sure that you are doing the thermochemistry equations. Make sure you're doing the quiz, on, quiz questions on Moodle. And also make sure, if you're using the online textbook, that you are also doing all of the assigned materials for that. Because it is quite complicated until you get used to it. And then it's pretty easy breezy squeezy. So that concludes the, the lecture on thermochemistry, and we will pick up with reaction rates and equilibrium next time. Have a good day.